My number seven best chess game of the 1930s is the opening game of the 12 game match between the new Soviet champion, Mikhail Botvinnik, and Solomon Floor. Now, Floor was at this time considered to be maybe the strongest possible challenger to world champion Aliyekin. He'd been dominant in many events, although he had struggled in his individual matches with Aliyekin. He was born in Ukraine, moved to Czechoslovakia, but when the Nazis invaded, he had to flee to the Soviet Union. By his own admission, after the war, his chess was never quite the same. Now, Botvinnik, on the other hand, obviously ultimately became the patriarch of Soviet chess. After becoming the new Soviet champion, he needed training matches, and this match was organized by Nikolai Krylenko and Ilyan Janevsky. These are two of the founders of the, of the Soviet chess scene. Now, Ilyan Janevsky died in the siege of Leningrad when in 1941, a Nazi bomb struck the barge that he was traveling on. Krylenko is a figure that you might not have heard of, but he really did maybe more than anyone else to help establish early Soviet chess. Now, that might make you think that he's an admirable figure, but such was not the case. This was very much a political game for him to demonstrate Soviet dominance. And you see that train of thought extending through to, for example, the Fischer vs. Spassky match. Now, Krylenko was a committed believer, committed to belief in communism, the Soviet Union, Stalinism, and even the purges. He once said, we must execute not only the guilty, execution of the innocent will impress the masses even more. This horrifying statement is perhaps one of the most ironic statements of all time, as he was himself killed in a purge in 1938. Botvinnik and Floor are two of perhaps the greatest positional chess masters of all time. So what opening should two great positional masters contest? Well, I can't think of a better opening choice than the Karo Khan. Now, after this, we get d4, d5, pawn takes d5, pawn takes d5, and c4. It's not called the Panov Botvinnik attack for nothing. Now, here we see knight f6, knight c3, knight c6, bishop g5, pawn takes c4, d5 attacking the knight which jumps into e5 and queen d4 a beautiful central location for the queen the knight hops into d3 forcing white to give up the bishop for the knight bishop takes d3 pawn takes d3 and now white can simply capture back here and maintain a good position if you want to be a little clever and not capture back yet rook d1 is also a viable move However, it turns out that Botvinnik makes a huge positional mistake in this position. In fact, this mistake is so large, I can't really wrap my head around it. And one of the greatest positional players of all time didn't realize the magnitude of his error after Bishop takes f6. Now, this capture here, not a tactical error at all, turns a position that's about a half pawn better for white into one that is more than a half pawn better for black. In fact, very, very soon, Stockfish thinks that black is almost winning. This move saddles black with a poor pawn structure, but it also concedes the bishop pair. Now, I think Botvinnik must have been thinking that the pass pawn on the d-file should have some strength but it ends up permanently blockaded and of no value. It's really incredible to see how the game develops, and if you, like me, struggle to see how Black's advantage is quite as large as Stockfish thinks it is, and as it proves to be during the game, then I really encourage you to study this game closely. Now, after Bishop takes f6, you can capture back in both directions, but the correct capture is definitely e takes f6. This move here does allow white to establish what seems like almost an extra pawn here in the middle of the board because black's extra doubled pawn over here doesn't seem to have value, but black is going to be able to achieve a construction where there's a, there's a bishop on d6, a bishop on d7, and then open c and e files that his rooks are better able to use than the white rooks. Also, black is going to be able to expand with the pawns on both sides of the board. Let's see how all of this develops. Queen takes d3 here, and now bishop to d6, knight g to e2, both players castle, very sensibly, and rook to e8, a beautiful post, of course, for the rook. Rook a d1, bishop g4, rook to d2, pawn to a6, taking control of this b5 square so the knight cannot hop here, and also preparing to play pawn b5 at some point. Knight g3, rook to c8, 
Black has rooks on both open files. Now pawn to h3, pushing the bishop back, but the bishop is really happy on d7. This is a good moment to kind of look at this position and appreciate black's advantage, which Stockfish now says is a full pawn, negative one. These bishops are beautiful. Typically, you want to blockade with knights instead of bishops, but the blockading bishops here are excellent. Look how they range across the board. Additionally, these bishops are perfectly supporting expansion like pawn to b5, pawn to f5, maybe pawn to g6 in the right moments. And black is able to work around the central construction with moves like maybe rook e5, c5, queen e7, etc., etc. As the pawns advance and black's bishops just maintain their incredible postings, it's really hard for white to find a foothold in the position. So here we see uh, rook fd1. I would like to mention the idea of knight e4 because this is really kind of the only active square available to the knights in this game. Why not jump into e4 and attack this bishop? Well, basically the bishop is just going to move and in a moment the knight is going to be evicted here from the e4 square and the bishop can pull back. So going to e4 unfortunately for white never achieves anything in the long term because the square is unstable. Really, it's in black's control. So after rook fd1, we see g6 establishing control over f5. Same basic thing if a knight goes to f5, by the way. If you had gone to f5 earlier, the bishop would move, and then you would have been evicted. So now rook e2, an exchange of rooks really doesn't change anything because the rooks are not the basis for black's advantage. Knight takes and pawn to f5. Knight d4, it looks like a good square, but it really doesn't do anything. The knights are permanently restricted by the bishops and the pawns. Queen e7, queen d2, rook e8, taking control of the e-file. The knight pulls back so that there can be exchanges on the e-file after rook e1, and that does happen, but it doesn't change the nature of black's advantage. Rook e1, rook takes, knight takes, and b5. Further expansion. Pawn to a3. King g7, very patient, an improving move for the king, knight f3. And now this move is a little bit odd. Black is in position to play pawn to a5. It makes sense to play pawn to a5. This is definitely the right way to proceed. However, floor continues here with bishop c8, repositioning the bishop to put pressure on d5. But we've seen that the d pawn is so ineffectual, you don't really need to pressure it. So it does seem that staying on d7 is a little bit better. King f1 here. Bishop to b7, and now b4, trying to close things off here on the queen side. Unfortunately, eventually black can always achieve pawn to a5 with strong effect. In fact, this is a perfect time to do it. Pawn to a5, knight takes b5, and bishop a6. This is why you can't capture here on b5. For example, knight d4 trying to hold on here, and then pawn takes, pawn takes, and queen e5, and there's not a good way to hold everything together here. The knights are totally stuck. This knight stuck defending this knight. This knight obviously pinned the d5 pawn vulnerable. This is just winning for black. Instead, though, floor plays king f8 instead of pawn to a5, and this is maybe a second inaccuracy in a very, very accurate game. The king is not really better on f8 than on g7, and this move doesn't really serve much function, but it also doesn't change the nature of his advantage. King e2, pawn to a5 now, queen d4, and white is achieving a queen trade, but that's not really going to solve the problems. Queen takes d4, knight takes d4, the b5 pawn is falling. Is Botvinnik going to get enough exchanges here to basically uh, eliminate his advantage? Well, no, and it seems like Floor has calculated very well here because he captures on b4, knight takes b5, and this is a good moment to pause your video and find the next move. Well, Floor is not retreating his, his bishop here on d6. Instead, he plays pawn takes a3, incredibly sacrificing the bishop. And at this point, of course, he's also seen the beautiful follow-up in two turns. Now, Botvinnik does capture on d6. Of course, if he doesn't do this, then he's just going to lose to this very strong pass pawn. So he does have an extra piece. a2. And he must step back and stop the pawn's promotion, knight c2. There's really not a big difference if you go knight b3 instead. And now, again, I would encourage you to pause your video. If you haven't seen this move coming yet, it's really critical on this next turn. Well, we're not capturing on d5 when black is not worse, but you're also not really in a position to win. Instead, bishop a6 check. 
a beautiful move. After the king moves out of the check, king e7, and this knight is beautifully trapped by this bishop here on a6 and by the pawns. This domination, one more time, of the knight by a bishop in this game is both instructive and thematic. So there's no choice. The knight has to be given up for a pawn, and it doesn't really make a difference if you capture the f7 pawn or the f5 pawn. Botvinnik chooses the f7 pawn. Knight takes f7. King takes f7. King to d4 here and bishop f1. A pawn is lost over here. So h4, bishop takes g2, king c5, and pawn f4. This is the 40th move, and Botvinnik chose to resign without continuing this game. This might seem surprising since he's only down one pawn, and this pawn seems like it's fairly strong, even though his knight is obviously restricted forever to trying to hold back this pawn. But it turns out that the winning plan is clear, and I'm not 100% sure, but I suspect the game was adjudicated so the players were able to analyze at home for a really long time, which is why what might seem like an early resignation is very justified after a full night of analysis. Essentially, what's going to happen here is Black is going to be able to bring over the king at some point because this pawn here is going to be vulnerable to the bishop's attack. You're probably going to advance it to a dark square and it's just going to be blockaded. Then black is able to force white into Zugzwang at some point. You could put the bishop on d1 or possibly on a4 and trap the knight over here and you can shuffle running the white king out of moves. That will eventually win the d pawn and eventually you can then proceed sometimes without even taking time to win the d pawn with the king into the king side you'll just mop up and win the game the computer at this point already indicates negative three and so botvinnik decided to give it up and focus on the next game well i hope you enjoyed this really rich game it's one of my favorite positional victories of all time every time i replay it i feel like i learn something new so if you want to see more of my favorite chess games of the 1930s then simply click on the playlist that is popping up on your screen as i speak